a strict imposition of one's will upon the universe and other people, irrespective of their own needs or their own happiness. It can only operate by the deliberate suppression of compassion. Magic is ultimately materialistic and cruel. Religion, by contrast, involves the deliberate submission of one's will to that of a higher power. And this creates a relationship. It requires the acknowledgement of the real existence of another being, another sphere of being. So it has to introduce some measure of compassion. The Christianity of Armenian magical scrolls perhaps mitigates somewhat their magical essence. The poignancy of the tragedy of Lilith forces the hand of folk religion. She's given children. The magic worked against her, therefore, acquires a good reason to become provisional, to work only for a certain number of generations, or only in a house where the requisite talismanic scroll is hung up high to trail down to the floor of the pregnant woman's bedroom. For all too has her needs. The legend of Cyprian that I mentioned is interesting in another way too. As a magical text about a magician, it's as close as we come in the primary literature of the craft to authorial autobiography. Its salient feature is a career cut in half by failure and then galvanized by vision and subsequent conversion. And in its barest essentials, this describes the trajectory of many outsider artists and of the practitioners called devoteras in Ethiopia, whom I'm now going to discuss. The devotero, the word comes from a Greek term for parchment, is like, and remember that parchment is associated with scrolls, is like the Armenian diratsu, an unordained Christian religious practitioner regarded as a sage. And he makes magical scrolls for Ethiopian Orthodox Christians. We have that to make sure. And here he is making one. There it is. And we're sort of looking down from his own head level here. And he's copying. There's, there's one that's already been made. He's considered a holy man in his community, but he can also inspire fear as someone abnormal. One death terror, a man named Osiris, is recorded as having had an initiatory dream. In it, a luminous being commanded him to eat the thigh of a hyena. Now you remember I've mentioned the hyena already. He's an impure animal. So this is a rather shocking thing to do. He did this with pleasure, however, understanding that God is capable of purifying the impure. It is St. Paul thought. There are several features of interest here. First of all, the initiatory dream. Did it exist in Armenia as well? Yes. The 18th century Armenian Ashur Sayadava minstrel had an obligatory initiatory dream in which St. John the Baptist, the equivalent of the Muslim Khidr, taught him how to play musical instruments. In the medieval period, the poet Konstantin Yerzingatsi had a vision of a luminous being before he became a master of the poetic art. So there's ample precedent in Armenia for initiatory dreaming when one begins a certain kind of secular career involving uh, imaginative labor. Although I don't know in any case for Adira, so we have to try to triangulate. The command to Osiris to eat something uh, long and impure is obviously sexual, and it represents a traumatic experience transformed into a positive one. And one is reminded forcefully of the prayer. So here he eats the leg of a hyena. Osiris's communication with the other world seems to have continued over time. He had a kind of guardian spirit, the angel Gabriel, who he believed had once intervened to rescue him from misfortune and with whom he believed he had a special connection. Tradition attributes to Deptera's other supernatural experiences as well in connection with their acquisition of the magical knowledge of their profession. Tawani, a 17th century Ethiopian liturgical poet and master of the occult, used to feast with invisible demons and was lifted up into the air once by unseen women and carried to Lake Tana, where he learned folk remedies. He made a talisman that kept the angel of death away from his house for a full seven years. 
And such talismans against the angel of death also recall the themes of some Armenian ballads, particularly the one of Prince Aslan, which I won't go into right now. But again, we have parallels in every other Eastern Christian culture. In Ethiopia, a master of talisman making trains acolytes for seven years before they get a notebook, a death terror, of their own. It can be a demanding job to be a death terror and a teacher. Asres, for instance, always wanted to study liturgical poetry, but never had time. The scrolls themselves are strikingly similar to Armenian Humayuns, down to the cross-hatched pattern and invocations of the Holy Cross. Yes, please. Thank you. Instead of writing here, we have eye-like portrayals of crosses, or crosses with eyes. The scroll's length conforms to the height of the client's body. Next picture, please. Here's an example with its owner. Uh, the body, all of which is intended to protect and heal. But in Ethiopia, and again this seems to be the case in Armenia, a scroll that had belonged to a deceased relative can be reused, with the old name scratched out and that of the new owner inserted. Scrolls are rolled up and kept in a case, under one's pillow or near an afflicted limb, or they can be hung vertically. Sometimes a priest visit, visiting an alien and an ailing parishioner in Ethiopia might read such a scroll as it hangs over a, a, a sick person's bed. A jug of water is placed nearby, and the priest will dip the cross in it while reading out a prayer, then blow on the water and sprinkle it on the patient. These practices might have had parallels in Armenia, but again, we lack testimony. With the modernization of Ethiopian society, the traditional role of the Deptera has slowly begun to disintegrate. One traditional maker of such scrolls, however, a man named Gedewon, who died in the year 2000, was befriended by the scholar Jacques Mercier. He began to work more freely as a creative artist, util utilizing the themes and skills of his own native craft, and eventually exhibiting his work in Paris. His paintings, removed from their traditional context, are now studied under the rubric of outsider art, where they find affinities with the canvases of other visionaries practicing outside the formal art world. What is certain is the similarity of the subject matter of the Ethiopian and Armenian data. Like Armenians, Ethiopian Christians consider Friday the day of special danger. I mentioned the Urpata here. The outsider artist Gede, one I just mentioned, painted a special talisman for that day. This is his Friday talisman. Uh, done as a painting, though, no longer as a scroll. Like Armenians, Ethiopians regard the cross as a sign of victory, more than as a reminder of Christ's suffering, and tend not to portray the crucified body thereof. They call it typically the cross conqueror of enemies and use it abundantly. And this has a great many Armenian, um, a great many Ar Armenian parallels. And in the next picture, please, the Ethiopians will use the cross of Kiprianos. This is the text of Kiprianos only in Ethiopic. Again, with an enormous cross, the new symbol with which he will work his magical powers. 